Here is what your typical morning schedule may look like. You wake up every morning by the alarm on your phone. You turn off the alarm and go to the toilet, turn on the LED bulb and spend some time there with your phone. You get ready, wear your smartwatch, take your laptop with you and you leave your home for office or college, right? However, what you may not know is that in each of the steps that I just talked about, you end up using one common material, semiconductors. From the phone and laptop that you use to the LED bulbs and circuits of your car, semiconductors are literally all around us without us even realizing this fact. In the span of a few decades, semiconductors have turned out to be a commodity that is more precious than anything else, including gold or oil. And India is one of the largest semiconductor markets valued at $27 billion. However, most of the Indian semiconductor requirement is fulfilled by imports. And the manufacturing is actually controlled by a handful of companies. Taiwan, South Korea, Japan and China. Why is that? Why doesn't even the US feature on the list? Well, to understand this, we have to know the backstory of semiconductors. So it actually begins with the haloed Silicon Valley itself. Initially, people used big glass tubes called vacuum tubes to make electronic devices work. But they used to be enormous in size and used to get really, really hot. And scientists naturally wanted something smaller and better. So in the 1940s, three scientists at Bell Labs in the US invented a transistor. A transistor was a type of semiconductor that did the same job as vacuum tubes, but it was much smaller in size and it did not heat up. In 1956, one of the inventors of the transistor, William Shockley, left Bell Labs and started his own company in Mountain View, California, laying the foundation of Silicon Valley. Now, initially, semiconductors were made of germanium, but later we started using silicon to make them, hence the name Silicon Valley. So, moving forward, in 1957, eight employees of William Shockley left his company and founded their own company called Fairchild Semiconductor. And Fairchild became the foundation of the semiconductor movement in Silicon Valley. It was a training ground for many future leaders in the industry who were basically Fairchild employees who left and started their own ventures. Modern day giants like Intel, AMD and National Semiconductor all trace their origins back to Fairchild. And this phenomena of employees leaving companies to start their own ventures became a hallmark of Silicon Valley's entrepreneurial spirit. So anyway, coming back. Now, over time, the people in Silicon Valley found ways to put more and more of these transistors onto small pieces called chips, making computers and phones and basically anything that used those smarter as well as faster. The more transistors on a chip, the more powerful it is. The first chip to be fabricated ever was a 16 transistor chip built in 1962. And today, our gadgets have billions of transistors on a single chip and billions of dollars are being poured into research to put more transistors on a chip with the effort to make them even more fast. Now, you may be wondering here, if all the initial designing and inventing happened in Silicon Valley, why do Taiwan and others dominate manufacturing today? See, the designing of these chips is a research-intensive process that can be done in a relatively smaller lab as well. However, the manufacturing of these semiconductors is a different ballgame altogether. The manufacturing of semiconductors is technically known as fabrication and the manufacturing plants are also known as fab, which is a short form of fabricators. Now, fabrication is an extremely labor intensive as well as an extremely resource intensive process. You need an unlimited and uninterrupted supply of electricity as well as ultra pure water to these fabs and you need a gigantic skilled workforce as well as a gigantic manual labor workforce. And labor has always been expensive in the US. So for the same reason why almost everything is made in China today, including the laptop or phone on which you might be watching this video, Silicon Valley companies started outsourcing the fabrication process to East Asian nations, where the resources as well as the labor were cheap and abundant. And these US companies started focusing on the fabless model instead where they spent all their time and resources to figure out how to design and manufacture these semiconductors and the actual process of manufacturing or fabrication was outsourced to Taiwan. Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company or TSMC was founded in 1987 and it became the world's largest semiconductor manufacturer. 
and this was also when Asian governments realized the upcoming importance of these sectors. These governments, especially those of Taiwan and South Korea, started heavily investing in the semiconductor industry. They provided subsidies, infrastructure and education to support the growth of this sector. So as the semiconductor industry grew, it became more specialized. Different regions and companies across the world began to focus on different parts of the supply chain. So while the US retained leadership in chip design, software and certain high-end chips, Asia dominated in manufacturing, assembly and testing. This was also how China became the assembly house of the world. It was close to Taiwan where the chips were manufactured in unprecedented volumes. Then quickly shipped to China which assembled the chips with other components and quickly shipped the final product all across the world. The result is that as of today, Taiwan and South Korea dominate semiconductor manufacturing while the US still plays a leading role in design and software. Companies like Intel, Nvidia, Qualcomm and AMD are leaders in chip design and based in the US. However, this does not mean that Asian companies have been unable to crack the design process. With so much investment in research, there are companies in Asia that specialize in manufacturing as well as design, such as Samsung and MediaTek, which have their own processor ranges of Exynos and Helio. And since Taiwan, South Korea and to some extent China are already so ahead in the game, it has been tough for India to catch up. We have been trying to bring semiconductor manufacturing to India for more than five decades now, but with no success. In the 1960s, India was being considered to open the Fairchild Semiconductor Manufacturing Plant, but it failed because of regulatory and bureaucratic hurdles. Yes, the same Fairchild who was the forebearer of the semiconductors and gave Silicon Valley its name. So it could have been India instead of Taiwan. Then again in 1984, India set up the Semiconductor Laboratory or SCL in Mohali, Punjab, which started production well before Taiwan's foray into semiconductor manufacturing. However, this plant was completely destroyed in a fire that broke out in 1989. Now, whether this fire was started accidentally or intentionally as sabotage is still unclear. But the result was that the fab did not restart manufacturing until 1997. And by then, obviously, it was already too late. Then again, in the late 2000s, Intel was looking for a global expansion and it was willing to set up a plant in India. But we lost it to Vietnam due to the same infrastructural and bureaucratic challenges. So clearly, the biggest reasons behind India missing the train have been policy paralysis from the government and a lack of resources. So what is changing now? Why have the avenues suddenly opened up for India? Well, there are domestic as well as international reasons for this. So domestically, as I said, up until now, we did not really have the economic resources to do so. Attracting these chip makers to set up a plant in India means giving them several economic incentives as well as subsidies. Unlike Taiwan, India is a gigantic country and we have always had more important economic issues that needed investment. But now, India has been one of the fastest growing economies and we can now actually afford to invest in the future. Also, domestically, India itself has a gigantic market for the consumption of semiconductors. Our annual domestic chip consumption is estimated to be $27 billion right now and it is expected to reach $55 billion by 2026. So if we are able to meet even a small share of this demand through domestic manufacturing, it will be a big win for India as well as the chip maker who decides to invest in us. Now coming to the international scenario. See, semiconductors are used everywhere, including automobiles and high-grade military equipment. And obviously, most of the global demand is imported from Taiwan. Now, China has been threatening to annex Taiwan for several years now, similar to how it annexed Tibet. In fact, the US believes that the annexation is bound to happen by 2027. And if this happens, the entire control of semiconductors will pass into the hands of China. China will then always hold the cards, threatening to wage a trade war and cut the supply of semiconductors to any country it doesn't like, jeopardizing important sectors like automobiles and even military equipment. So be it India or the US, everyone knows that China is not someone you can count on. And therefore, there is an international eagerness to create a new base for these semiconductor factories, where India, fortunately, has an excellent international reputation right now. So due to a combination of these domestic and international reasons, 
India is in a position to get its own semiconductor fab now more than ever before. Capitalizing on this situation, India has been pushing hard to get the first semiconductor fab established. So in December 2021, India announced a $10 billion production linked incentive or PLI scheme, where it would provide massive incentives and subsidies to companies looking to set up semiconductor fabs in India. And under the scheme, India had received three major proposals to set up a factory as well. Of which the most prominent was from a Vedanta Foxconn joint venture to set up a $19.5 billion fab in India. If you don't know, Vedanta is an Indian multinational mining company, while Foxconn is the world's largest technology manufacturer based in Taiwan. Note here that neither of the two currently manufacture semiconductors. So this joint venture was being touted as one of the greatest things to ever happen for the Indian economy. But recently, the joint venture was called off with neither of the two companies telling exactly why they pulled out of the deal. It is being speculated that Foxconn was doubtful of Vedanta's ability to find a technology provider since neither of the two actually has the technology to make semiconductors. So they were looking for existing global manufacturers who could have licensed them this technology. It is also being speculated that Foxconn was wary of Vedanta's increasing debt load. As of today, both Foxconn and Vedanta are now independently looking into ways to set up a fab in India. So coming back to the PLI scheme. The government was left with no takers for the $10 billion scheme. Earlier, the scheme had a 45-day deadline for companies to share proposals. And this deadline had ended in February 2022. But since there was no feasible proposal, it has now been reopened by the government with a much longer than lenient deadline of December 2024. India has also been seeking support on international forums, particularly from the Quad Partners, where we successfully signed MOUs with the US and Japan in March and July this year, respectively, to promote the design as well as manufacturing of semiconductors in India. And recently, there has also been some hope from Micron, one of the largest chip makers in the US, which has agreed to invest $2.75 billion in India to set up a semiconductor unit. And thanks to the PLI scheme, Micron will be eligible to receive up to 50% of its total project cost from the center, the central government. The first ever made in India semiconductor chip from their plant in Gujarat will likely be produced in 18 months, that is December 2024. As per a report by Deloitte, the global semiconductor industry is anticipated to grow to $1 trillion by 2030. And this is probably India's last chance to jump on the bus. But even with all the support from the government and the geopolitical landscape, India has a tough road ahead. One of the biggest challenges is a lack of expertise. When you're spending $10 billion to set up a factory, you naturally want to staff it with experienced people. And for chip makers, the dilemma with India is you have the world's brightest workforce, but there is no experience in actually working in a fabrication foundry or factory. Secondly, it is an extremely competitive space. Even after all the international resistance against China, the fact remains that their pockets go much deeper than us and they are already ahead in the semiconductor manufacturing game. Moreover, the annual consumption of semiconductors in China is 7 times higher than India's annual consumption, making it much more lucrative for shipmakers. And where India has pledged $10 billion, China has already pledged $143 billion to the exact same goal of giving a push to its semiconductor fab industry. And it is not just China. Even the US recently passed the CHIPS Act, investing $280 billion to promote their domestic semiconductor industry. And in front of all these numbers, $10 billion seems like quite a small amount. So beating these competitors is not going to be easy at all. But the good news is that while the process might be slow, India is definitely on the right path. To get ahead, you need to get started first. And true courage is to take the first step even when you cannot see the staircase ahead. As a takeaway, you should seriously start considering adding some semiconductor companies to your portfolio. With the current push by the Indian government and the exponentially increasing demand for semiconductors, the entire industry is set to grow in India. And I'm sure that right now there is a small SME working silently in some corner of some industrial town in India that will be a multi-crore enterprise in the coming years. It is an opportunity of a lifetime and with enough analysis and luck, you may get your hands on a multi-bagger stock. I have added a list of semiconductor companies in the description below that are currently listed on the stock exchange. And while you are there, please follow me on LinkedIn as well. 
Personally, I'm really excited to see how the semiconductor landscape evolves in the coming years. Let me know in the comments what your thoughts are on India's opportunity in this space. If you made it so far, please hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. I need your support to take my thoughts to more viewers across India. Let me know in the comments which video you want me to cover next. Until then, goodbye.